Pour valoriser son capital naturel, le Gabon se positionne sur différentes options entre crédit carbone et crédit biodiversité. Le Gabon est déjà très avancé sur la question des crédits carbone. Avec un capital de 100 millions de tonnes de crédits de CO2 séquestrés par an, valorisables aujourd'hui sur les marchés, ça permet à notre pays de pouvoir se positionner sur ces marchés. L'idée aujourd'hui est de pouvoir répliquer cela à la question de la biodiversité, dont les crédits sont plus complexes à mettre en place, parce que la biodiversité ne va pas adresser une matière unique comme le CO2, mais va adresser aussi bien les espèces que les habitats. Sur des marchés qui sont encore moins matures, des concepts qui sont encore moins évolués, mais arriver à capitaliser sur ce patrimoine naturel pour pouvoir continuer de valoriser notre biodiversité, notre conservation et financer justement le développement à travers le capital naturel. L'eau, la terre, les forêts et l'air sont des biens communs parce que l'homme est responsable de son avenir et celui de la planète. Ensemble, faisons en sorte que développement et environnement soient complémentaires. Pour les générations futures, saisissons ensemble les enjeux planétaires du changement climatique. Pour atteindre les 30% d'air protégé de la planète en 2030, et si la solution la plus concrète passait par des mécanismes de compensation financière Quoi de plus logique après tout que les pays bons élèves qui ne polluent pas et qui, au contraire, sont les premières victimes du réchauffement climatique, perçoivent une compensation financière de la part des pays les plus industrialisés. Sur le continent africain, de plus en plus de voix s'insurgent contre cette injustice climatique. Effectivement, l'Afrique n'est pas responsable de la situation, mais subit le plus les effets du changement climatique. Et nous voulons, au-delà de ces deux messages-là, montrer également que l'Afrique est une part de la solution. Dans la lutte contre les changements climatiques, des pays sont des pays solutions, sont donc des pays qui n'ont rien apporté en termes de contribution à l'émission de gaz à effet de serre, qui n'ont rien apporté en termes de dommages. Donc aujourd'hui, ces pays qui sont des solutions, parce qu'elles absorbent du carbone, donc ces pays-là, aujourd'hui, veulent avoir une voix qui doit être entendue. Le Gabon est devenu un champion de la lutte pour la préservation de la nature. Le pays est couvert à 80% par la forêt tropicale. Début octobre 2022, les Nations Unies ont certifié 187 millions de crédits carbone gabonais. Une véritable reconnaissance. Mieux, le Gabon est le premier État africain à avoir été rémunéré pour la protection de ses forêts. CAFI, c'est une initiative pour la forêt de l'Afrique centrale et un fonds fiduciaire qui est le plus grand fonds des Nations Unies pour la protection du climat et des forêts et qui est entièrement consacré à la protection des forêts de l'Afrique centrale et à l'amélioration de la vie des populations. Donc le Gabon est un partenaire très important pour CAFI et depuis deux ans, nous avons un programme dans le cadre duquel nous compensons le pays pour les réductions d'émissions. Donc le Gabon est devenu ainsi le premier pays en Afrique. Mesdames et Messieurs, nous allons prendre le deuxième panel sur la finance et sur la coalition de champions pour la finance durable. The second panel will start in a few minutes. So please uh, take your seats. We will start in just a few minutes. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, are we ready to take up the second panel? Est-ce que nous sommes prêts pour le deuxième panel? Est-ce que nos panélistes peuvent se rapprocher de la scène, s'il vous plaît? Can the panelists move to the front of the scene? Thank you. à recevoir une compensation de la communauté internationale pour avoir réduit euh, ces émissions provenant de la forêt et euh, des fermes. Donc ça représente 150 millions de dollars sur 10 ans. C'est historique parce que le Gabon est le premier pays en Afrique d'avoir signé un tel accord et d'être compensé euh, pour euh, les réductions d'émissions. Donc ça paraît plaît. beaucoup, mais en fait ça ne représente qu'une fraction de tout ce que les forêts gabonaises absorbent de l'atmosphère chaque année. Vous savez peut-être que 140 millions de tonnes de CO2 est absorbé par les forêts, ce qui est équivalent au retrait de 30 millions de voitures de la circulation chaque année. En quelques années, le marché mondial du carbone est devenu un véritable outil pour la croissance économique verte. Mais qu'en sera-t-il demain Pour valoriser son capital naturel, le Gabon se positionne sur différentes options, entre crédit carbone et crédit biodiversité. Le Gabon est déjà très avancé sur la question des crédits carbone, avec un capital de 100 millions de tonnes de crédits de CO2 séquestrés par an, valorisable aujourd'hui sur les marchés. Ça permet à notre pays de pouvoir se positionner sur ces marchés. L'idée aujourd'hui est de pouvoir répliquer cela à la question de la biodiversité, dont les crédits sont plus complexes à mettre en place, parce que la biodiversité ne va pas adresser une matière unique comme le CO2, mais va adresser aussi bien les espèces que les habitats, sur des marchés qui sont encore moins matures et des concepts qui sont encore moins évolués, mais arriver à capitaliser sur ce patrimoine naturel pour pouvoir continuer de valoriser notre biodiversité, notre conservation et financer justement le développement à travers le capital naturel. L'eau, la terre, les forêts et l'air sont des biens communs parce que l'homme est responsable de son avenir et celui de la planète, ensemble, faisant en sorte que développement et environnement soient complémentaires. Pour les générations futures, saisissons ensemble les enjeux planétaires du changement climatique. Pour atteindre les 30% d'air protégé de la planète en 2030, et si la solution la plus concrète passait par des mécanismes de compensation financière, quoi de plus logique après tout que les pays bons élèves qui ne polluent pas et qui au contraire sont les premières victimes du réchauffement climatique perçoivent une compensation financière de la part des pays les plus industrialisés. Sur le continent africain, de plus en plus de voix s'insurgent contre cette injustice climatique. Effectivement, l'Afrique n'est pas responsable de la situation, mais subit le plus les effets des changements climatiques. Et nous voulons, au-delà de ces deux messages-là, montrer également que l'Afrique est une part de la solution. Dans la lutte contre les changements climatiques, des pays sont des pays solutions, sont donc des pays qui n'ont rien apporté en termes de contribution à l'émission de gaz à effet de serre, qui n'ont rien apporté en termes de dommages. Donc aujourd'hui, ces pays qui sont des solutions, parce qu'elles absorbent du carbone, donc ces pays-là, aujourd'hui, veulent avoir une voix qui doit être entendue. Le Gabon est devenu un champion de la lutte pour la préservation de la nature. Le pays est couvert à 80% par la forêt tropicale. Début octobre 2022, les Nations Unies ont certifié 187 millions de crédits carbone gabonais. Une véritable reconnaissance. Mieux, le Gabon est le premier État africain à avoir été rémunéré pour la protection de ses forêts. CAFI, c'est une initiative pour la forêt de l'Afrique centrale. 
et un fonds fiduciaire qui est le plus grand fonds des Nations Unies pour la protection du climat et euh, des forêts et qui est entièrement consacré à la protection des forêts de l'Afrique centrale et à l'amélioration de la vie des populations. Donc le Gabon est un partenaire très important pour CAFI et depuis deux ans, nous avons un programme dans le cadre duquel nous compensons le pays pour euh, les réductions d'émissions. Donc le Gabon est devenu ainsi le premier pays en Afrique à recevoir une compensation de la communauté internationale pour avoir réduit euh, ses émissions provenant de la forêt et euh, des terres. Donc ça représente 150 millions de dollars sur 10 ans. C'est historique parce que le Gabon est le premier pays en Afrique d'avoir signé un tel accord et d'être compensé euh, pour euh, les réductions d'émissions. Donc ça paraît beaucoup, mais en fait ça ne représente qu'une fraction de tout ce que les forêts gabonaises absorbent de l'atmosphère chaque année. Vous savez peut-être que 140 millions de tonnes de CO2 est absorbé par les forêts, ce qui est équivalent au retrait de 30 millions de voitures de la circulation chaque année. En quelques années, le marché mondial du carbone est devenu un véritable outil pour la croissance économique verte. Mais qu'en sera-t-il demain Pour valoriser son capital naturel, le Gabon se positionne sur différentes options, entre crédit carbone et crédit biodiversité. Le Gabon est déjà très avancé sur la question des crédits carbone, avec un capital de 100 millions de tonnes de crédits de CO2 séquestrés par an, valorisable aujourd'hui sur les marchés. Ça permet à notre pays de pouvoir se positionner sur ces marchés. L'idée aujourd'hui est de pouvoir répliquer cela à la question de la biodiversité, dont les crédits sont plus complexes à mettre en place, parce que la biodiversité ne va pas adresser une matière unique comme le CO2, mais va adresser aussi bien les espèces que les habitats, sur des marchés qui sont encore moins matures et des concepts qui sont encore moins évolués, mais arriver à capitaliser sur ce patrimoine naturel pour pouvoir continuer de valoriser notre biodiversité, notre conservation et financer justement le développement à travers le capital naturel. L'eau, la terre, les forêts et l'air sont des biens communs parce que l'homme est responsable de son avenir et celui de la planète, ensemble, faisant en sorte que développement et environnement soient complémentaires. Pour les générations futures, saisissons ensemble les enjeux planétaires du changement climatique. Pour atteindre les 30% d'air protégé de la planète en 2030, et si la solution la plus concrète passait par des mécanismes de compensation financière, quoi de plus logique après tout que les pays bons élèves qui ne pouvaient pas... Hello, hello, hello. Could, could all the panelists take their seats, please? Est-ce que tous les panelists peuvent s'asseoir? Le public également. On a déjà pris un peu de retard, donc on va essayer de faire maintenant le, la. C'est pas vraiment une transition. C'est on va poursuivre. Hein? Hein? We're going to continue. The discussion that we just started, but we're going to do a deep dive on carbon credits. Um, on va plonger dans le monde des crédits carbone. Is that how you say a deep dive in French? I think it's good. It works. <laughs> it's a good way to on say. On va it. plonger dedans. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, I don't know if I should. Should I say two or three minutes of introduction, or should I just let yes, you? Yes, please. Ok, so, so, donc, notre espoir, um, notre espoir dans cette uh, session, c'est, on a entendu parler beaucoup ce matin de, de crédit volontaire, on a également entendu deux, trois fois crédit souverain, il y a un processus de création de, ou de validation de réduction des émissions de, de CO2 euh, dû à la déforestation et la dégradation de la forêt, RED+, qu'on a négocié pendant dix ans dans la Convention climat de 2005 à 2015 à Paris. Les pays forestiers, surtout les pays en voie de développement, 
On fait la fête parce qu'en 2015, on a gagné l'article 5 dans l'accord de Paris et c'était euh, le, 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 disons, c'était le départ d'un travail de longue haleine pour mon pays, le Gabon. Ça nous a pris cinq ans à compiler toutes les données techniques à soumettre finalement les documents qui, qui, qui sont presque comme, le, pour moi, c'était comme une deuxième thèse. Mon forest reference level, mon niveau de, de référence forestier pour le Gabon. Nous avons suivi... Many experts uh, had to work with us to evaluate. My friend Hans is there. So when we validated this agreement of 450 million dollar for the payment of the result with uh, Norway's the OGT, three year, uh, three months. That's audit of United Nations to three years. And the United Nations canceled a certain number of credits validated by the auditors of Norway. So we had to reduce our credits. So the United Nations uh, credit say that uh, they don't conduct credit uh, audit, but uh, we have the Varsovie framework. We have all these tools on which all the countries in the world agreed But we, as Gabon, are a little bit disappointed because we created our red plus credits and we realized that uh, our partners, uh, developed countries, uh, who committed to pay uh, are missing in action. Well, we are told that you've done all this with the United Nations. Now you have to go to the uh, voluntary market. Yeah. Or you have to go to uh, biodiversity credit. So I think that uh, we have to match the uh, voluntary and the, uh, the other market to get to, 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 to together. We have to nest them. The, the, they, must, they must have national systems and voluntary market you know, on which uh, natural market can uh, very fastly act. This can be a uh, motor for innovation because it is in a voluntary market that we are going to create the... Uh, so, so we have to find synergies. We have to find We have to compensate uh, different states, and we have to increase the carbon market. We have the uh, forestry market, which is uh, 200 billion ton, so it should be uh, 20% of the uh, solution. So we should have a uh, carbon market of minimum 10 million dollars. So how together between the sovereign And the willing, uh, the volunteer market, we can go to 200 million toll to 10 billion toll minimum. Thank you. Merci, merci, Monsieur le Ministre. Alors, je sais que les que les ministres ont un engagement. Well, I know the ministers have a busy agenda, so we'll start by ministers. So, do you want to add something? Well, I think we'll give the floor to experts. So, you know, we conduct all these summits. Uh, I think I'll say thank you to uh, Philippe for all the works conducted. As he said, uh, how important it is, these uh, voluntary market. It is very dynamic with a huge potential We've been able to see that with two million, uh, they have uh, 
multiplied by four, the result and the statistic says that they can go to uh, four billion by 2030. And African countries, of course, must be able to take profit of this opportunity. And I think that today that uh, that's what has to be exploited and there can be more. Uh, I also, without uh, spending much time having some critiques, uh, polemics on the quality of the foreign products which are increasing. So the, you have two ways of seeing it the criticality you think are a risk or an opportunity. I personally think that uh, it's uh, an opportunity to start thinking on how we can improve all this. I think that uh, we have to start this reflection uh, of the co-benefits of the carbon credit. This means that uh, we uh, should not only say that one ton of uh, uh, carbon, but we have to go beyond and say that what is the impact on the nature and what is the uh, uh, impact on the quality of uh, population living standard and the uh, job provision, the uh, air quality of soils in with the job. So this is what Paulus Manuel said and this, uh, this high value uh, carbon credit with uh, uh, you know social a social dimension. So in fact that we have to get out of just one line and have a holistic uh, perception of the thing. So we would like to listen to you sir. Well, thank you. So, uh, as we've seen it this morning, I think we uh, have been talking about this issue of money. There are some other points on which we all agree, and everybody felt it. There's a massive need for funding uh, to conserve, manage, and restore the uh, tropical forest. The second point on which people agree is the market mechanisms are one of the necessary tools to bring a significant uh, import, but we have to respect an integrity in the use of these uh, carbon credits and these uh, certificates by companies and uh, other actors. So third point is that the funding has to go to the uh, high environmental quality project, uh, bring funding on the ground to pop local population and meet the need to countries with a low deforestation, such as Gabon, in the Congo Basin. This is a point on which we all agree. But there are many other discussion or diverging points, many approaches. We've seen many variants, uh, critiques, and controversy that uh, makes this market today boiling when we talk about the uh, s private sector. Now, if, if we have to discuss these issues, so we have organized the discussion today uh, between two uh, panels, uh, let's say it's a panel uh, on uh, voluntary uh, carbon credit and the uh, sovereign uh, carbon market. So let's resign that uh, this is a simplification, as uh, Minister Lee said, uh, to structure uh, and allow expert to uh, express themselves uh, clearly but these uh, subjects have not uh, divided or opposed. Now what we are trying to see is how bridges can be created in order to have uh, uh, a simplified market or something that can be much. So we are going to invert the two panels and then start uh, specifically by, uh, as we said, uh, we start by sovereign uh, carbon credit and state initiatives. So these initiatives on the Article 5 of the Paris Agreement uh, developed uh, slowly, uh, slowlier than the uh, uh, voluntary market. And today, they are emerging and applying to mechanism on some markets that are also mechanism uh, destined to markets. And many uh, legal approaches are also emerging to uh, uh, voluntary uh, market. 
and there are many critiques around them. We talked about them. We have uh, questions of linkage uh, and uh, basic scenarios. So we might have to start by the first element on the initiatives of states, uh, in which it will be interesting to listen to the vision of countries who have launched their uh, project in that regard, and some financiers and some other uh, stakeholders, because many approaches and standards are being developed. So to start, uh, maybe to set the decorum, I would like to give the floor to uh, His Excellency Simo Kerepa, Minister of Environment and Climate Change of uh, Papua New Guinea. His Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to be here with my Prime Minister, Right Honorable James Marape, and my colleague Minister for Forestry to attend this Milestone One Summit, One Forest Summit. This is an important session, thus, my pleasure to speak on for my country, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is part of the uh, Asia Pacific Forest, one of the three basins that make up the lungs of the world. PNG was the first countries to propose the developing countries with high levels of forest cover should be recognized and support for the efforts to maintain them. We present this idea together with uh, Costa Rica at the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, a uh, UNFCCC COP 11 in 20, 2005. Over 12 years, all 192 parties of the UNFCCC worked to develop a global standard for forest which was finalized with the enshrinement of Article 5 of the Paris Agreement agreed at the 21st Conference of the Parties in Paris in 2015. The UNFCCC Red Plus mechanism is designed to ensure that the financing for develop, developing countries is in place to support the efforts to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. The Red Plus mechanism readiness phase put much needed support to the forest sector, particularly in building technical support, technical capacity of the forest, land use, and biodiversity conservation sectors. Yes, there has been some public finance for Red Plus in this regard. However, finance to support verified Red Plus emissions and removals has not materialized at this necessary scale. Further, the absence of compliance market for Red Plus sovereign carbon to rely on donor support to protect our forest, we need to be able to generate revenue from the protection of our forest. Our forest owning communities want to conserve their forest, but they require a regular revenue stream as they receive from logging and mining if they are to convert back to conser conservation activities. We currently have a market failure that only the government of the world can correct. We understand that the world is concerned with reducing emissions by moving away from fossil fuels and encouraging new growth forests. But, I but if standing pot uh, tropical forests are not conserved, they effectively could emit more carbon emissions in the future, making a goal to keep the global temperature below two degrees very unlikely. Keep in mind, we have around one, one trillion tons of carbon stored in the world's forest. If we lose them, we had over three degrees or more. Furthermore, the same forests are, the same forests are removing carbon from our atmosphere annually. The number of the countries in the three basins are net removers, meaning we remove more carbon than we emit. PNG. Gabon and Congo are example here today. As all 192 countries agreed in COP27 in Egypt, the Red Plus mechanism welcomes both public and private finance. The Red Plus mechanism is moving with the necessary speed and scale. The sovereign carbon generated under the UNFCCC Red Plus mechanisms meets the highest atmospheric standards anywhere in, in this planet. At this time, to scale up the compliance carbon markets globally to mobilize the required capital to slow, stop, and reverse global deforestation. We have to. We have one planet. We have one global climate agreement. Only one red plus mechanism. All three forest basins are delivering emissions reduction and removals. Let us unite to empower the red plus mechanisms. Thank you. Merci. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much, Minister. Maybe uh, if you go from a basin to another, I'll give the floor uh, to uh, Mr. Akim Dauda. Uh, we have a microphone here. So, Mr. Akim, uh, on the fund, Gabonese fund of investment, uh, maybe to give us more information on what Gabon has been doing so far. And then, no, what is underneath to, uh, to make this project uh, viable on the market? Uh, Roger, thank you. I would like to thank the organizers, uh, including uh, all the participants who came from um, everywhere to discuss on this very important issue and for us to get out of this conference with uh, a way forward. I think that before we go to the nitty-gritty, we may have to reset the decorum or uh, recontextualize the issue or during the uh, GEF report. It is important to put at the center uh, countries, uh, whole high forest or low deforest deforested country, which today are stabilizers uh, at climate level and for years have not been included or taken into account in the discussion of climate change and nature of conservation. Now, in terms of carbon credit, three elements uh, can be mentioned. First of all, let us revise the approach we have on this issue radically. Uh, I'll take the case of rationality. Uh, six months now, the Gabonese fund, strategic fund that I lead, was mandated to monetize the credit carbon and me with the market and the verifiers and everything around. What is the supplement? The thing is the forest of a Congo Basin and the other virgin forest today don't have any additionality in terms of their role in the, the role they play in climate change. And they can't be uh, used to mobilize funds. Just this is not a good model that incites. Uh, maybe share a little story with you. I, I have two little story, two people. One works well, always have 19 under 20, and the other one is always average between 13. That student who came who usually have 19, comes home with 15, and then she's blamed. And then her sister tells her, you know, when I have 15, they take me to a restaurant. That is why you, you'll be fine, because you used to have 19. Now you got 15, you're being blamed. This is what is happening to Gabon and other countries, that you're wrong to do well at the beginning. No, we are not going to drag on that. We are here to find solution. And one of the solution is to be more ambitious replace this uh, additionality issue to uh, an ambition to preserve all the forest, all the virgin forest, which today we doubt their role. You don't have this protection, all this balance that we have, all the commitment that we have, all the mo uh, clean mobility, the energetic transition or the uh, construction, uh, wood or timber construction, all this won't make sense if we don't protect the uh, Congo Basin and all the forest related to it. That was the first point. On the second point uh, is at this level, with the case of Gabon, we talked about sovereign carbon credit that we created, but these carbon credits integrate a wider system in which we try to see how we create an economy of carbon which is going to serve all the uh, people, nature, and planet. When you take the case of Gabon and you use our natural heritage to optimize and develop the uh, chains of values and localities and uh, promote investment, the carbon, sovereign carbon credit of Gabon, which today you know, have the highest level of quality, will allow the Gabonese Republic to avoid having to arbitrate between developing their economy for their population and preserve the nature. And today the word cannot 
cannot have a country such as Gabon, which have done this choice. And that's the second point. And the minister said it. We have 90 millions of certified credit, but monetize these credit will allow us, first of all, to continue to conserve nature. Secondly, to uh, create, uh, let's say, uh, economic uh, outlays for the population around these forests. Third, invest for future generation and create a share prosperity. Four, invest in social infrastructure. And five, finance the, uh, the reimbursement of our debt. This will allow the debt, the country, to continue to conserve. That means the call to action is it would be good for the market and certification agency to develop more inciting models out of which we, it is less complex because we don't have it that much. And second, investors and countries must consider carbon credit as a tool, first of all, as a tool of development for uh, economy, but also as a tool of nat nature uh, conservation. Thank you. Well, I now among the uh, potential buyers, we also have a, we have not only the private sector but also state. And I would like to give the floor now to uh, uh, our sister, uh, the special envoy of climate and environment of Norway, uh, who is uh, going to share uh, the Norwegian experience with us on the result based on the red blocks. Thank you, uh, Philippe, and uh, thank you so much to uh, France and to uh, Gabon for hosting us uh, at this very important uh, summit. Uh, very grateful for the leadership that you are continuing to show. And uh, ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I represent uh, the government of Norway. I also represent uh, a part of the Norwegian government called the Norwegian International Climate Enforcement Initiative. And um, we, of course, uh, agree with all of you that we uh, urgently need to uh, speed up uh, progress to halt and reverse tropical forest uh, loss, uh, and that this has to be a global effort. More international cooperation is needed, and more effective and scaled-up finance is necessary. But I think I'll, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time on, on explaining our approach and how we are working. Um, and we have been doing so for 15 years now. We will celebrate our 15th anniversary in April. Uh, NICFI is the no uh, largest Norwegian uh, international climate, biodiversity, and sustainable development effort um, in com uh, the combination of the three. Ever we have an annual budget of uh, annual budget of about 300 million US uh, dollars. And I'd like to stress that from the beginning, we have focused on climate, biodiversity, and sustainable development, with a special focus on indigenous peoples and local communities. I mean, th these things are integrated. Uh, they cannot be separated. Uh, we see them as, um, as very much part of our mission. And we believe that high uh, integrity carbon credit is the most promising source of predictable and result-based funding at scale. It is needed to finance a transition that, it, that must come away from deforestation-driven economies and towards nature-positive economies. It can help the implementation of necessary public policies and benefit communities. The integrity and sustainability of forest credits is decisive. For the carbon market to, to scale, we need, uh, we need quality and standardization. Companies that engage in the carbon market on a voluntary basis must do so on top of their efforts to reduce emissions from their own operations. We need integrity both in the supply side and the demand side. For forest carbon credits to be uh, compatible with the Paris Agreement, they need to be issued at the national or state level. Such a jurisdictional approach to Red Plus is an absolute key. 
Recently, there has been a lot of attention in the media around the shortcoming of standalone carbon projects. Some of them are good in and of themselves, some are not. Sometimes they help communities and sometimes they do not help communities. And they might help one community but not the community next door. And rarely are they integrated in the national framework. To deliver the reductions we need in the time span that we have, we need to scale up jurisdictional red plus. But to avoid the technical risk ar around leakage and permanence, we must be vigilant. But even more critically, to support the public policies needed to stop deforestation, we have to have this approach. For about 15 years, we have worked with others to establish and implement jurisdictional red plus partnerships. We have now a range of experiences and we see impressive results as uh, Professor Lee said, including here in Gabon. And Gabon is a case in point. Jurisdictional red plus finance can support national parks, land use planning, law enforcement, and benefit communities. And I've been able to travel around this country and have seen this for myself. And that was a very um, rewarding experience uh, for me as well. We are proud of this and other partnerships and appreciate the host countries and the president's leadership on this issue. A lot of work and learning has gone into developing high integrity standards for forest credits, building on the framework we all agreed to under the UNFCCC. This includes the World Bank's Forest Car Carbon Partnership Facility, various bilateral agreements, and more recently, the Architecture for Red Plus Transactions, ARP. We see the emergence of large-scale buyer interest for jurisdictional, jurisdictional Red Plus credits through the LEAF Coalition, where Norway joined the United Kingdom and the United States to offer guaranteed floor prices, floor price for carbon credits. And 20 large corporations has joined this uh, LEAF Coalition and I think pledged about one and a half billion US dollars. It's not enough, but it's, it's a start. For forest countries, this represents an opportunity to access large scale finance at predictable time hori horizons, finance that can be reinvested in policy implementation. While these stand systems and standards are not perfect for all, for all future, we believe that the groundwork has been done to establish high integrity carbon markets for forest. However, we should track implementation and collect input for possible improvements for carbon crediting. And we very much look forward to the continued discussions on these issues at this summit. As has been pointed out by, I think, almost every speaker today, uh, one aspect that is not fully captured by carbon crediting system is biodiversity. And Norway agrees that more needs to be done to value biodiversity. It's a difficult challenge, but it needs to be done. And we are fully supportive of incentives to countries with high forest cover and low deforestation to access carbon credits. And Gabon is again showing that preserving forests takes real political will. It's not an easy task for any government. It takes leadership and political will. And we will welcome further work on how we best can integrate biodiversity into existing carbon markets or new mechanisms where they might be appropriate. We believe the best opportunity in the short term is to find a way to put additional value on biodiversity of high integrity jurisdictional red plus credits. This could benefit countries with high forest cover and low deforestation and it would maintain the focus on national efforts as opposed to standalone projects. To sum up, much needs to be done, but also a lot of progress has been made to scale up high integrity carbon market for forest. We should build on that. There are standards available for high integrity forest carbon at the jurisdictional scale. There are platforms such as LEAF to offer floor plies, and there are processes to address concerns to avoid greenwashing and other issues. Norway is keen to continue discussing these issues with other governments and other stakeholders. Norway joined the Forest Carbon Leadership Partnership 
FCLP, along France, Gabon, and a host of other countries, including other forest countries. This, we believe, is a good forum to follow up the experience and results from forest credits, both the voluntary market and from national achievements, and would be a good platform to consider proposals coming out of the World Forest Summit. Thank you so much, Philippe. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Now to close this first part of the uh, the initiative of states and the sovereign carbon markets. Uh, I'll give the floor to uh, the observer, uh, a very important observer on this uh, uh, aspect. We would like to have your vision. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, my name is Juan Pablo Bonilla. I'm the uh, manager of sustainable development and climate at the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, the most important NDB for Latin America and the Caribbean. It's a pleasure being with all of you today. And I think the, uh, the question of how we start integrating voluntary markets um, with Article 6, with carbon offset, with biodiversity, um, I think is the most important question. It's not an easy question. Um, I was part of the CDM board with Franz Tattenbach, the, the Minister of Costa Rica, about 20 years ago. And uh, when the CDM was created, we also thought uh, it was, uh, maybe we overstated by that time the role of the CDM and the expectations of the CDM. And we can learn from those experiences to not do the same right now with carbon credits or biodiversity credits. I like a lot what was discussed uh, as part of the panel before, that this has to become one more instrument, as you properly said about Gabon, when you see national plans that we didn't have after the Kyoto Protocol. I think the big switch and change that we have from Kyoto to the Paris Agreement were the NDCs. We didn't talk anymore about Annex 1 or Annex 2 or CDM or joint implementation. Now we have a, a more complex but more structured way to address these issues. We have the NDCs. And we have to come with investment plans related to the NDCs. So something that we're trying to do at the IDB, at the Inter-American Development Bank, as it was discussed at the panel, is to start integrating a dialogue of the ministers of environment with the ministries of finance and the different sectors to come with investment plans and then have different instruments to finance those investment plans. So we're developing a platform for ministers of finance to address different issues. Tomorrow, I will talk about the debt swap that we just did for Barbados, but also at the COP in Egypt with the Minister of Finance of uh, Uruguay, we showed the first sustainability link bond link to the NDC of Uruguay, just to give you an idea. But my point is that we are we're working a lot in advance to prepare the countries to do the frameworks and the KPIs that they need to measure to have sustainability link bonds or to have these nature swaps. So the question is how carbon credits and biodiversity credits are part of that picture. Because now that you have NDCs, uh, everybody's asking developing countries to say, your NDCs are not enough. You need to be more ambitious. The question is if you start selling carbon offsets, are they gonna go against your NDC or beyond your NDC? So you need to have a national registration. That's why I totally agree with what Norway said. We need to have national plans or state levels of national plans to say these are my commitments and these go beyond my commitments. So you can have examples of very good voluntary markets. Uh, and I'm seeing already in Latin America examples where you have a carbon tax. And then you have companies that start buying voluntary markets to comply to the national carbon tax. The question is, if you sell carbon offsets not to comply internally with your carbon tax, are they going to have the same price? Or are we expecting other countries or companies from overseas to pay more for those carbon markets? So there are many questions that has to be addressed. We need to have very strong registries. 
I was remembering when we had, when we had the CDN, we just have one registry at the CDN board UNSCCC. Now we need national registries at the country level to see what are related to NDCs and what goes beyond the NDC that we can sell as a carbon offset. But internally, if we develop carbon taxes, how we have the incentives for different companies, public and private, to have voluntary markets as part of that. And that's where the quality is important and the work with communities. I'm seeing very good examples in Latin America, like Fondo Acción Ambiental in Colombia, it's an NGO. They have built very good voluntary markets with local communities that companies are buying as part of the carbon tax and is registered at the national institution in charge of the taxes in Colombia because it's part of the tax. And you see in other countries of the region how good examples of voluntary uh, credits can become part of carbon offsets in the future. So for an NDB like us, we are not buying carbon credits. We are really emphasizing different instruments and how we can support countries to do the different things that I just mentioned, not only at the state level, but also at the subnational. I was at the C40 meeting about cities in Buenos Aires last year. Mayors are already issuing also green bonds, resiliency bonds. But mayors are saying, okay, what will be the role of carbon offset in city planning in the future? I think we need to do that at the same time when you talk about rural development. So we have the Amazon initiative at the bank. It's a new initiative that we're starting about sustainable development in the Amazon that goes beyond climate and biodiversity. It's about social issues, investment in cities, digital, sustainable infra, but bioeconomy will be a central part of the Amazon initiative. And we have a fund with the GCF, it's a bioeconomy fund, in which we are not only working with development banks of the region to have bioeconomy lines, but also with communities. COICA is a very important institution in the Amazon basin. They represent about 500 indigenous communities and we start engaging with COICA, and I learned a lot from that dialogue. They said, listen, we don't want to be beneficiaries of anything we do. We want to co-create with the IDB and be owners. So with COICA, we started strengthening COICA to develop projects, and now we're gonna maybe have a, a grant mechanism for them to start working about bioeconomy. There are many ideas in our countries about likely projects, but there are no projects there. A huge limitation in developing countries is the capacity to develop good projects. But you have to do that since the beginning with local communities, with indigenous, with Afro-descendant communities to be successful since the beginning. So we're learning a lot and we will continue learning in this process with COICA about bioeconomy, but I think could be the basis to have in the future either biodiversity or carbon offsets with community-based approach. And another example that I think is starting to work very well is the Habitat Bank that we are supporting in different countries of the region. The one that is more advanced is in, is in Colombia. It's, uh, it was developed by Terrazos, and it was to do compensation of biodiversity for projects of infrastructure that needed to do compensation of biodiversity with the National Licensing Agency. I think what they are doing in terms of monitoring and working with the private sector is gonna be key also to have good biodiversity credits. And to finalize, the IDB is not only the public side, we have Bid Invest, which is our private sector part, and Bid Lab, which is a lab of innovation. Bid Invest is starting a very important process uh, that is called Bid Invest 2.0. It's about the risking, it's about sharing um, to mobilize more resources. And I think the position of them will be to support in the future carbon offsets, only as David said in the panel before in the comments, if the companies show that they have a serious decarbonization power. This has to be a complement to that. We cannot talk about Paris alignment and then take carbon credits as, as part of carbon neutrality, but on the, uh, on the other side as a complement to reward not only what countries are doing, but also what private sector is doing at the local level, but also at the, at the international level. So I think to finalize, uh, we as MD base, uh, I'm here also to listen and to learn what could be our role to strengthen this into the future and how good carbon credits could be part of a, of a bigger picture related to different instruments uh, to find not only NDC but by adaptation of biodiversity plants. Thank you. Merci, uh, Juan Pablo. Well, thank you. Uh, and then by the 
by the same token, I, I didn't give the floor to Wanjari Matai. Uh, Wanjari, please, he wants to say something. Most uh, everything has been said, especially pertaining to the importance of whatever credits are out there to have the jurisdictional approach. We heard that very, w very nicely presented, the role of indigenous peoples and local communities and the genuine involvement of, of them. We know how so many times it has gone wrong when their involvement is secondary, it is brought much later. And then, of course, the, the importance of high-level standards. That, that has also been mentioned. I just wanted to underscore again the importance of the fact that we actually do not have much time. I think it's been mentioned here before that the, the 1.5 degree is, is a limit. It's not a target. So we are actually staring down the barrel of a gun, and, and so time is not on our side. And I think that also applies to how we cement the, the credits, the especially the jurisdictional uh, credits, with respect to the quality of both the supply and demand. There has been uh, an absolute erosion of trust, and I think that has made and delayed uh, the markets from cementing. We, at least in Africa now, there seems to be a second wave, and I hope that this wave will be bring with it uh, the integrity that's required, and we've seen that from some of the discussions here on how high forests, low deforestation countries really need this time not to see zero value uh, and to indeed be incentivized. So I want to stop there by saying that the time is not only not on our side, it's also not on our side in terms of cementing the direction we'll take so that the markets and the prices can be fair. Merci, uh, well, Wanzari, thank you. Then we can see, uh, obviously, to uh, thank you for highlighting the level, uh, the national level, and because we see that this is where policies are taken and the report with the NDCs, and at national level is key, and also the community level is also another aspect that has to be considered. Well, during all this time, we have a market, a uh, voluntary market that has been developed. Maybe to come back a little bit on that, which, of course, is uh, important now, and that market is diversified with different uh, project of uh, reforestation and conservation with different standards. This market, uh, as we say, uh, is being developed but remain small in terms of scale. But of course, in terms of the integrity of uh, a certain number of factors, uh, remains uh, criticized. So, so there are many initiatives on the way to improve that market, both from the, the uh, supply and the demand. This morning, we say that uh, the inclusion of biodiversity is at the center of this, you know, uh, reflection to improve this uh, uh, voluntary market. Maybe to dig a little bit, I would like to give the floor on the one side to one investor and, and a standardizer or somebody that makes the standards. Uh, I want to start by Margaret. Margaret, you want to start? Margaret Kim. On, on the gold standard, or you are the CEO. So how can the standard take uh, all these evolution into account and then improve, uh, uh, go to the high quality and integrity that we've been talking all about? Um, I, I realize preparing talking points for these panels become useless because I get so inspired by what everybody said, including the ministers. Um, so I just want to reflect on what I've heard and, and what's been sort of on my mind uh, starting from the morning session until now. Um, let's step back a little bit because there's a voluntary carbon market, carbon credits, carbon credits, carbon credits. But why were they created, right? And what is the current carbon credit stand for? So from gold standard, we believe carbon credit needs to be additional, permanent, no overestimation or, or minimize the risk of overestimation. It has to be a unique claim and it has to include SDG co-benefits and it has to follow the right safeguards and local consultation. If you meet that in current market, in the current market that we're talking about, it's a good carbon credit. 
And I, I want to emphasize, it sounds so easy, but if we get into the details, it's so complex. We've introduced SDGs to the market as an integral part of a good carbon asset. We pioneered it seven years ago to, to completely restructure our standard to require SDGs. And we are notorious for complex, uh, onerous reporting requirement for those SDGs because we truly believe those SDGs bring price premium. And we do see that. We see the tendency. And as, and as the current market structured, we don't have price transparency beyond what leaves our registry. So it's very hard for us to say, but if we sort of look at the estimates, we, we do see 20 to 30% uh, price premium on those projects that report on credible SDGs. But anyone and everyone in the current market can report against SDGs and claim that the project had co-benefits. Because there aren't that many standards that require it, require it and have rigorous process of monitoring it. So where do we want to draw the line? And, and I, I ponder, like I think about Akim's earlier comment, because the current market was created so that, that carbon credits incentivize change, hence additionality. But if, if we're talking about carbon credits or carbon assets or biodiversity assets that, that incentivize conservation, do, what are we doing? Are we trying to force fit the ideas that that's, that's two different ideas into an established market? Or should we think about an innovative, truly innovative mechanism to really support that? Because you can't possibly ask the corporates, the companies that we work with, to just purely finance something out of goodwill. It has to count towards something, and, and that's the brutal truth of where we stand today. Why would a company or a for-profit organization or a fund invest in something that they can't claim towards something? So I think it's a, it's a multifaceted systematic challenge we need, to, we need to address because what can companies and investors claim against? That's the demand side of clarity we need. And what, me, what does a high quality carbon credit mean in that context? is another side of story that, that we need to figure out. And how can standards work together to create that harmonization that, that Minister White was alluding to earlier? Because it is true, if you talk to gold standard, we say something's good. If you talk to other standards, they may say something else is good that we disagree with. In the voluntary carbon markets in the last 20 years, that kept a healthy tension in a bottom-up demand-driven market to constantly work towards what's right and what's good. And that is confusing, and that is now coming back to us as a criticism that it's fragmented, that we don't agree on one thing, we're not bringing clarity. But that's how difficult it is, because it's not just simply the standards who set the rule, it's with aligning with the scientific evolution of what was norm then evolves into what is a norm today. So how do we bring all those different pieces together from supply side and demand side? And, and something really uh, challenges me is how do we build capacity? So in that, in that harmonization, I mean, we get requests from governments in Africa, we wanna build capacity to access the voluntary carbon market and I find it so frustrating because in order to create a good high quality carbon credit, the same skill set should be needed to create a good design and implement a good climate project or a conservation project. So I think it's not just about few standards that are floating in voluntary carbon market, but general standard bodies need to get serious in getting together and, and creating what that quality floor is. I think in the voluntary carbon market, we're seeing that through ICBCM, that they're going to launch their core carbon principles. We don't know what's going to be included in, in core carbon principles, but I'm hoping 
that that will set the quality floor. So I think there are, there are moving pieces that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to learn from it and really understand how a successful market mechanism can work because without that, again, earlier, I, I mentioned the balance and clarity of supply and demand. Without that, a market mechanism means almost nothing. So I'll end there. Thank you. Merci. Um, thank you very much, Margaret. It was a little bit of a problem because in the first five minutes, we thought it was going to be very simple. In fact, uh, it became quite complex. <laughs> So thank you very much for that uh, enlightenment. And now to end, um, we would like to ask um, Craig Coggett, in other words, uh, a big investor. Uh, as an investor then, how do you see the market today? Um, first, full disclosure, we work together a lot. And we're, we're on a lot of panels together. And um, Maggie, she's not Margaret. She's Maggie to me. And Gold Standard, our, our, one of our funds sponsored by the Green Climate Fund, is actually the first to be audited at the project level and at the fund level um, on multiple SDGs. And we are a mitigation fund, but it is all about co-benefits. We will not do anything with audited co-benefits. So um, I, we've been involved in, in the states in the formation. One of my partners was Schwarzenegger's environmental protection secretary. So we were involved very early in the carbon markets. We do not have a carbon tax, as you know, as much as we'd like one. So the voluntary market, um, there's state markets, but is, it is really important. Part of me says with the abuses, we should throw it out. Um, but when I hear Minister White talk about it's there, we have companies like Microsoft and others who are some Maggie's clients, Mars, who want to use it. Um, the abuses are obvious. Um, and the abuses, someone alluded to it, I think Simon Zadek did about traders. I mean, you know, the market is dominated today by traders. Um, when I hear that Cargill is selling some cover crops to people and they're taking carbon credits, it's absurd. But the projects we're talking about here, uh, looking at projects in Gabon as an example, I think can be done well with multiple co-benefits. And even though it is just one tool in the toolkit, I think it would be a mistake to get rid of it. Um, using a gold standard, using verified data, maybe even looking over the life of a project and, and phasing in, one thing we've talked about is phasing in the carbon benefits and auditing them and you can get more if the project does better, less if it does less, um, but particularly stressing the biodiversity credits because when the corporations are buying, whether we like it or not, it's for PR. I mean, they're particularly the voluntary goals. So they should want, this. we've seen the, the best projects, which is why Maggie's talking about a premium, relate to storytelling. And the stories involve the local community. They involve helping people with jobs, they involve, help, involve helping people with biodiversity, with agriculture, health. So I, I think we need to get this right. It starts with verified data. It starts with verification by a true nonprofit. Um, we, we should only be standards we need, but we, nonprofits need to certify. People can't certify we're making money off it. It just doesn't make sense. And, um, I, and I think we need to stress the co-benefit side and then try by cajoling corporations, putting some of the groups together to get people to pay more money for those credits. Um, but carbon credits are only still a partial answer. If we want to save nature, Minister White talked about water. Um, you know, the, the ecosystem of, of forests is so much greater. Um, there's agriculture, there's water. Uh, we, we need other mechanisms. I'm going to talk later on a panel about investing. I, I think there are tremendous investment opportunities um, around agroforestry, around ecoterrorism. Carbon credits are just one tool, and they're not enough, given the urgency. And I, and I think we still need remember, we're, we are forcing this into an established um, regimen, whether we need bio, I'm skeptical that we can get biodiversity credits. One of my things I would tell you is most people, we need to, I was speaking with Minister White, we need to educate people about biodiversity. Everyone here knows how important it is. Everyone here knows about what's going to happen in Egypt. 
But people don't under and people who don't even believe in climate change, they may be hopeless. But other people who do don't understand the importance of biodiversity. So that's one of the messages I think we on the GEF panel side um, need to have as an important agenda too. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. I don't know if we have the time to uh, take some comments or questions in the room. Do I have anyone? Uh, we can go ahead and find a microphone for that person. Do we have a microphone? Uh, perhaps we can begin in front of the room here. I don't know everyone, so perhaps you could just give us your name. Um, perhaps just uh, briefly introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Of the Republic of Rwanda. And I appreciate and I thank the government of Gabon and France to have organized these summit. What I want to contribute on the carbon market. First of all, there is a problem because the owner of carbon credit has no right to fix the price. And those who need our carbon credit are the ones who fix the price. And this, I think it is unfair. It is unfair because it, is, it should be a win-win situation. You need my product. I give you the price of my product. But when you are the one fixing the price of my product, it means I have no room for movement. Uh, secondly, we have to be pragmatic. <laughs> We have to be pragmatic. Uh, I mean, countries that are in Congo Basin and take the lead, first of all, of having our national framework to be able to penetrate the carbon market. Otherwise, if we continue to sell our carbon credit credit in peace means, of course, those who need our carbon credit will get a room to cheat us. I call it to cheat us because we have a product and we have the forest. Apart from the forest, I think we have other environmental initiatives where we can sell our carbon credit. Let's say we have a project of renewable energy. When you have clean cooking project, you are of course cutting down the cutting of trees. So, uh, and apart from tho those kind of initiatives, we have to put our effort together as people who are in Congo Basin as people who have the product to have our national framework and to have our one forest summit. As a result, we have our one price so that whoever wants to buy our product knows the price. We are tagging our forest, we are tagging our carbon credit so that people we come to us and uh, I'm not talking about take it or leave it, but I'm talking about we have product. So people who want our product should accept our pricing, but not the ones fixing the price. I thank you. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. I'm Beatrice Atim Anyoa, Minister of Environment, Uganda. 
Many know me as the mother of the forest, and I'm happy to be here. Now, just to add on what my sister has just said. Yes, I think we need, we are climbing the tree from the top. Because the carbon credit is a new area to many people. And I'm addressing myself to my brothers and sisters in Africa that many things are still very new. I think what we should have done and what we are asking to be helped with, one, we need to build our capacity to know more about the carbon credit. We need to ensure that the natural resources we have on the continent has full data, has full value. We must have the data clear and we must attach a value. And that value will help us actually negotiate because we have something, a product, as you're saying. But what is the worth of our product? We are doing so much in my country about conservation. But what is the value? And we need also to be helped. And friends, we need to put a regulation. Each country must put in place a regulation that will guide us on how we are going to dialogue with partners coming to share with us our God-given resource. Uganda, as my country, we are already we are already processing the regulations. We are not yet engaging or accepting to go into a dialogue when we are blind. We need the regulation of Uganda and of each of our countries to guide, to give safety for our current generation and the new and the future generation so that this might not become again a curse. We are oil producing country already. Those ones have always been termed as a curse to a country. We don't want the carbon credit to become a curse to our countries. So let's not rush, be enticed with what is coming when we don't even know where we are going. You don't go swimming in the waters which you don't know. We must be very conscious about this, and Uganda is very conscious. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, thank you. I am Lucia Madrid from the Architecture for Red Plus Transactions. And yeah, I would like just to share uh, an initiative we just started uh, that has relationship with what has been said in the previous panel on this one. As you know, we have a standard, the TREES standard, that is to uh, certify credits from jurisdictional Red Plus um, programs. And this year, we just started an initiative to develop an additional certification of co-benefits of those uh, RED programs. We will be developing uh, the certification in three components, biodiversity, uh, non-carbon related climate benefits, and social benefits. And those will be developed by, uh, with the support of uh, technical committees and we have just formed the Social Technical Committee where COICA that you talked about is part of it and another indigenous uh, people's organization from uh, Africa, Repaleac, is also uh, participating and other two indigenous peoples and local communities organizations from uh, Latin America. So we hope that this process uh, will be able also to learn from what has been shared here and what is uh, being developed as part of the JAF uh, report um, and of course learning from other experiences that have already started to, to, to try to um, have a, an external verification of those co-benefits and as it was said, not only um, having claims on what happens but a, a, a means to certify them. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um. Uh, merci. Um, thank you for the floor. I am uh, Marie Claire Abogendonga. I'm the president of an association 
here in Gabon. And uh, I'm presiding over an association for the defense uh, of the rights of the rural populations here in Gabon. And at the same time, I'm a member of the network of the different organizations uh, for the green economy in Africa, here in Central Africa. So I'm taking the floor uh, concerning what has already been said in the first panel and also the present panel. And I'm a little bit lost, excuse me. And uh, Minister Lee White this morning said that we are working in negotiations. We're going to be talking about things that sometimes make people a little angry. And so, excuse me if you think I'm a little bit angry, but I'm going to talk to you from my heart. Now, the Minister Lee White, he said this, Gabon has made a big effort, and we're here in Gabon. Can we ask you sincerely uh, some of the problems in Gabon? Because, you know, we said this morning that this uh, uh, summit meeting is just not going to be another opportunity to do some blah, 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 that we're going to have to lead to actions. And so what I want you to understand is that the different actions that were taken in 2015 in terms of the financing, we're now in 2023, and we still do not have a beginning of the implementation. And so I have the feeling that we're still just negotiating a new time periods and a new uh, a payment uh, schedule. And so it seems to me that we cannot uh, go, go on this way. And so have you heard the cry coming from the Gabonese government, uh, for instance, or even from the president of the uh, Gabonese Republic, who has just uh, been endowed with a, a ministry, a state ministry, which is responsible uh, for uh, the fight against uh, the cost of living here. And so, I mean, there is an impact on the economy. In other words, the deep causes are uh, perhaps uh, partially because of the effort that Gabon has uh, granted to the preservation of uh, nature. And also, it is perhaps one of the causes, uh, for instance, uh, what we're undergoing. And so the Gabonese people, uh, for instance, uh, they're in their own uh, houses, they are being attacked by the elephants. We're trying to spare the elephants. And so this is the price to be paid. And so uh, should we continually wait for some kind of a protection of the local population from the elephants? And uh, so we have to go to the different uh, banks uh, for the financing. I don't know if you've read the uh, local newspaper and the uh, cry from the heart of the Minister of the Environment in here in Gabon, when he says what we would like to have is that we do not want to depend on gifts from the international community. It seems to me that our dignity ought to be important. And so why should we spend so much time in order to set up those carbon markets? It seems to me that we've already made a great deal of effort. We've already carried out actions to protect the elephants. We have fulfilled the criteria that has been required in order to have a certain quality of carbon in our country and in a positive level of emissions. So now, and how is this quality being appreciated? When this was decided in the beginning, I mean, what was the result? What was the objective? And so now, uh, we're talking about uh, a credit for the biodiversity. It seems to me that that ought to be supported by different studies and so on, scientific studies. We've done them, we've carried them out. And so it seems to me we're going backwards. And so what is the type of uh, development that you're proposing today to the different uh, developing countries? Because we cannot advance, uh, so please, you know, in the name of the civil society here in Gabon that I represent here at this meeting, it's we should take into account the interests of the rural populations. We need to find our dignity. And so if you give us a gift, that's as if we are beggars. And so we know how to produce, we know how to carry out studies, and we live off the forest. We live off our earth. Uh, and so if we have zero for the deforestation, I mean, that's just a dream. And so, I mean, no, of course, so we have to live off the forest. We cannot survive this way. So if you want us to uh, have zero deforestation, then how are the local communities going to survive? And so we want to live on, on what? If we have to stop everything and protect the elephants and so on. And so it seems to me that this carbon market, uh, the biodiversity market, ought to be regulated. And even uh, 2025 is very far away. I mean, you are diplomats. Maybe uh, you don't have time. But you know, it is very difficult for us at the present time. So it seems to me, from my heart, I told you I would speak from my heart, but uh, it seems to me 2025 is too far away. It's too far for the Gabonese people. And so it seems to me that we have to go on to action very quickly. And so we have done what is humanly possible 
for other people. And so we have been forgotten because some of the Gabonese people are dying because of the elephant. I uh, thank you very much uh, for that cry from the heart. And uh, just perhaps a last uh, comment uh, before we have the closing of this panel. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Daniel Zarin. I'm from WC WCS. And I, I'm of mixed minds on intervening because my heart is very touched by the comments that I've heard here from the uh, African leaders and participants. And uh, it is a reality that is new to me. And I am, I will confess, I'm not going to speak from the heart. I am a scientist by training, so I will speak from from the science and share with you a, a concern that arises as we're having this discussion that is focused on a market, a particular kind of a market, which I've been involved in over the past 15 years or so, um, that may not quite be fit to purpose. And this is something that um, Margaret was mentioning earlier. As if we look at the science around climate change, the first thing that we know is that the problem is not caused by something going on in the forest. The problem is 90% caused by fossil fuels, right? by the emission of fossil fuels. The question is, what is the extent to which the... Si, it's on. You see, it's on? I, I didn't just, I didn't press hard, I just went on. And the extent to which the forest is a climate asset is very large. But the part of that asset which intersects with the carbon market is not so large. If the, if the forest is the size of this whole room, the part that intersects with the carbon market is maybe the size of the stage that is here. And that's where all of the attention is focused. It's on the, uh, uh, maybe it's about four, maybe it's about five billion tons of emissions, that, uh, of net emissions that we try to reduce, right? And that's what the carbon market is based on, trying to reduce those and consider them to be just like fossil fuel emissions. But the bigger role of the forest is actually in absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. In the beautiful intact forests that you have here in Gabon, other places of Central Africa, uh, in, the, in South America and parts of Asia as well. And the carbon markets don't do anything for that. If you take that away, however, you will raise the global temperature by another half degree, at least. And that number, a half degree difference in the global temperature, is worth tens of trillions of dollars to the global economy. Not to mention all of the human suffering that would be caused by adding another half degree to the global temperature. And we don't yet put any value on that service. It is an ecosystem service in the sense that Carlos Menlol was talking about this morning with the Costa Rican example. And in Costa Rica, the Costa Rican government developed this model to pay for that ecosystem service. Red Plus is not a payment for an ecosystem service. It is a payment to intervene and stop something that would be happening. But we ought to be paying for the service of global cooling that forests provide. It is worth tens of trillions of dollars and the global economy is a free rider on this service. So having said that, I, a colleague of mine in an earlier session had a, just a minute. I'll just add another minute. In my organization, we've spent the past year developing a methodology, reaching out to colleagues in the private sector who are actually a bit interested in this. We have an agreement with the state of Amazonas in Brazil to develop pilots on how to go about starting to pay for that service. We call it our High Integrity Forest Investment Initiative. Uh, if it, others are interested in this, I'm happy to talk more about it. The, the corporates are interested in it because in a technical sense, they can, s they can see that they can, make, they can claim that they're making a contribution to something. They can't count it as an offset. It's not an offset. They can't say we're paying for this instead of reducing emissions, but they can say we're making a, cl we're, we're making a global contribution. And for many companies, they're starting to be interested in that. So lots of details, but I just wanted to introduce that we, it's a different conversation than we're having about credits, which are defined as offsets in the carbon market. Thank you. Merci. 
thank you. Uh, Mr. Minister, did you want to say something? Th thank you, thank you so much. I just want to make a very quick um, uh, comment. I know everybody's ready for uh, for the lunch, but uh, I think that um, I understand all the concerns and uh, and uh, desire for things happening faster and at a larger scale. But I, I don't want everybody to leave kind of feeling that nothing is happening. I mean, a lot of things are happening. We have a very different place that we were 10, 15 years ago. I tried to mention some of the things that have happened uh, in the last few years. A lot of exciting things are being launched as we uh, meet here in, 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 in Gabon and uh, uh, at the, in Glasgow, which uh, in my view was uh, very much a, a force, uh, COP, uh, well, I think was a great success. But let me just mention, I think Lee White, uh, Professor Lee White did mention it briefly, but since Gabon was mentioned, um, Norway, do not have a lot of um, traditional interest in Gabon, but we have a large scale cooperation on climate biodiversity and sustainable development with Gabon. And the reason we do have that is because you have a lot of forest, you have a low deforestation rate, you're doing a lot of the right things, and we see Gabon as a real partner. We have other partners in all uh, the important uh, Forest, tropical forest uh, basins around the world, and we work closely with them. In this country, we have entered into an agreement only two and a half years ago of 150 million US dollars over 10 years. I was here in uh, June or July last year uh, to um, participate in, in, in the, the launch of the, of the first contribution from Norway within this framework of 17 million US dollars. It's not a large amount, but it's a beginning. And this is something we do because we want to support uh, Gabon's effort to keep the forest but secure and the biodiversity, but secure a future for its young and growing population. So please keep that in mind as we talk about all the challenges we have and all the issues that are out there. Things are happening. We need to scale at a different scale, and we need to speed it up. But it's not all bleak. We are working on it. Thank you. Merci de donner une petite note. Uh, thank you for giving a positive note to end this panel. And so we will not be able to uh, solve all the problems today. So the objective, rather, is of our discussion is to create the conditions so that we can continue with the technical dialogue and to work with the simplification of the um, scenario. I think we should try to give a clear view to our buyers and our investors and so that we can uh, try to encourage them to continue to support us. So if you can see, uh, the different initiatives are not contradictory. But of course, uh, we do lack a sort of a, a collective vision uh, for the different uh, market players uh, to see what they can do with their financing. So we have said that we cannot or we don't have to recreate the wheel, but there are a good number of initiatives. And so we can try to see how we can integrate the markets in a better way in terms of the supply and the demand. So there's one point that I think that ought to allow us to look uh, further and to try to see, uh, look um, at the different uh, existing initiatives. When we're talking about biodiversity and also the Jeff report, seems to me it gives us a good framework in order to allow us to go in the right direction. And the second one is the uh, tie between the uh, jurisdictional level and the present market, wherein we have not yet completed the studies. The technical dialogue also should be more intensive and we would like to propose that in the coming weeks, we should finalize sort of a working plan uh, with um, all of the different initiatives that already exist. And then uh, we also should keep in mind the different events uh, that we have in the coming months, and especially the uh, summit in June in Paris, and also the COP28 at the end of the year. So I'd like to thank all the different panelists who have uh, joined us and the different uh, participators. Thank you. Vincent Medibe is measuring the bronze trees in hundreds of one hectare plots all over the country. Vincent's team from the National Parks Agency recorded high.
and species of every tree. And from there, calculate the biomass and the amount of carbon in each plot. C'est vraiment avoir un le stop, c'est-à-dire la quantité de carbone que nous avons, et de faire aussi le suivi dans le temps pour voir aussi le changement en termes un, de la structure de la forêt et aussi le changement en termes de, de, de carbone parce que le carbone est dynamique. Above Vincent's system, satellites orbit any change spotted in Gabon's forest cover generates an immediate alert at Agios, the nation's Earth Observation Agency. A new track through the trees, a possible sign of logging activity, an expansion in mining, legal or illegal, all immediately recorded and investigated. Dès que le satellite passe, fait l'acquisition d'images, on voit qu'il y a des changements. Tout de suite, on fait l'alerte, on fait le rapport et on, on va sur le terrain pour vérifier s'il n'existe plus. Mais quand on